Welcome everyone to the uh, City Council meeting for April 9th. Welcome Council back in session again. Uh, the first item of the evening is always a public forum. The public forum is an opportunity for individuals to speak to the City Council on any city related issues except for those items which have already been heard by a hearings official or are on tonight's agenda as a public hearing. Each person will have three minutes to speak. When you come to the podium, please give your name, city of residence, and for Eugene residents, your ward if known. The timer and lights indicate the time you have to speak. A yellow light will come on when you have 15 seconds to complete your comments. The red light indicates the end of three minutes. We have 12 people signed up for the public forum this evening. And we'll start out with Michael Todd, followed by Jerry Smith. Michael Todd. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Todd, or actually Stephen Michael Todd. The reason that I sat here today is that we obviously, words, we're not being listened to, we're not being taken, and I apologize for my smell right now. I, the Red Hats, you ever seen the Andy Griffith show, Mayberry? Well, the Red Hats have become basically a Barney Fife. I had permission from DePaul security and from the owners to be over by the public restroom. Right now I am soiled of myself because they said, oh, you're trust, they just pointed to say, oh, you're trespassed. If we were treated, if we treated our pet, I'll calm down, if we treated our pet, if we had, were given permission to have a pet and treated our pet like we are being treated, the SBCA would, would put us under the jailhouse or either want us exterminated. We are humans. We are all flesh and blood. And they still, 3 o'clock in the morning, raining. They wake them, kick them hard in the feet, wake them up. Don't even give them a chance to get nothing up, nothing out of the rain, and kick them out. We are human beings as everyone else. Why can't we play nicely in the sandbox? That's all i got to say because this is the last time I stand here. Thank you. Jerry Smith is next, followed by Carol Bird Caldwell. I'm Jerry Smith. I live at 54, 5041 Saxon Way in Eugene. Um, I, I thank you for the opportunity to be on the, the Homeless Task Force. Um, and and uh, I, I guess I'm just impatient. I, I couldn't stand three months of talk with, with people homeless in, in the winter. Um, I was away at Christmas time, but I think it was a horrendous thing to do to, to turn people out into the woods, in the bushes on Christmas Eve. I think that was, I, I hope you fire whoever planned that. That was just, uh, you'll, you'll never live that down. It, that, that, that is as evil as, um, as it can be. I kept a few people comfortable at, at great expense to, to people who were, were vulnerable and, and, hurting. Um, I, it, at some point, you, you're going to, the, the idea of not having a, a legal space for people to be turns everyone who goes broke in Eugene into outlaws. And they get treated like outlaws. They get fined and they, <laughs> you find people that don't have any money. It doesn't make any sense. You take them to court. You sit. The city's running low on funds, and you spend thousands and thousands of dollars prosecuting people for for living through the night. Um, it's it's amazing that the, the numbers aren't greater. Um, it it takes money to have um, an apartment or. A, a room or a motel or hotel that most of us can afford. But uh, in November last year, there were 17,000 people in Lane County who didn't have any money at all. They just had food stamps. And uh, some people can get along that way. Um, families take a lot of them in. 
but uh, we all know that the numbers of people who are broke uh, are huge and they shouldn't be punished for being broke. It doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever that our citizens are outlaws. Carol Berg Caldwell is next, followed by Michael Kasahun. Thank you. Carol Berg Caldwell, 2510 Augusta. Greetings, Mayor Piercy Council. You've recently received my letter of commendation for Eugene Muni Court, so my comments tonight are more for the record. I've observed at Muni Court for two years and have come to appreciate much about this court, most recently for their ethical responsiveness to three suggestions I'd made to inform court clients of their right to discovery, to obtain police reports, in-car videos, all materials related to their arrest or citation, as follows. One, one, judges could inform defendants who had pled not guilty that they could request police reports. And I have heard judges three times in recent months inform defendants of this. Two, the video aired each day in court about rights and other info could be edited to also include info about discovery. Three, a flyer could be displayed in court lobby about discovery. Well, commendably, Muni Court did produce and distribute such a flyer. I tell you with certainty, court clients very much appreciate this information. More people are now requesting police reports, which provides them with helpful advance information about police allegations behind their citation or arrest before they go to trial. I've also suggested three things EPD itself could implement. Along these lines, too, we'll keep you posted. While I'm very appreciative Muni Court took this step towards improved transparency, I've suggested improvements to this flyer. For example, the headline, Pro Se Discovery, may not be understood by many. Explaining those Latin words pro se could help. It means essentially being your own attorney. Discovery means obtaining all police reports. The flyer mentions fees for discovery, but no fee schedule. People with limited funds might feel daunted about even pursuing discovery unless they knew in advance the fee is often fairly minimal, as little as five bucks for written police reports. Flyer also states police reports won't be given to people who lack photo ID. An alternative solution could perhaps be found for this. For people who lack photo ID should not be denied access or their rights to obtain discovery. My thanks again to our Eugene Muni Court for producing this vital informational flyer. While the April 5th Eugene Weekly reported these flyers were no longer available in court lobby, I observed daily there. These flyers have been in the court rack every day since first printed. Many people are pursuing discovery. Well, I've discovered we have a court that responds to input, that is transparent, that upholds solid judicial ethics in holding offenders accountable, informed of their rights, and protective of those same rights of the innocent. Thank you. And here is this flyer. I did provide you all one. Next up is Michael Casahun, followed by Irene Cardenas. Um, Mayor Piercy, City Council, first and foremost, I appreciate your time allowing us to um, come forward and speak to you. The three minute, unfortunately, will not give me uh, uh, point tenth of a, a percent what I wanted to share to you all, but um, mine is specifically to request. Can you give your name for the record there, please? Michael Casahun, resident of Eugene. Thank you. I apologize for that. Um, it is um, specifically related to Eugene Police. Um, I have approached the auditor's office. Um, the conduct in which I was um, labeled by the department individual um, labeled me a flight risk. Um, perhaps if I, my name was Muhammad or some, um, I could have been labeled as a terrorist, but my only connection is that, as far as I know to the day that I was um, de uh, detained by EPD, and um, uh, on their own report, under Unipolis guidelines, my understanding is that any arrest or any police report is supposed to be read, proofread, reviewed by their sergeant. That was not the case on my on my case, and excuse me, obviously. Um, I happen to be slightly different than most of their suspects they are usually handling. Um, I don't think Eugene police are racist, but I do believe they lack understanding of how to deal African-American male. There's a failure in the department. I met with the Chief Kearns, with Acting Captain uh, Pete Despange. I met with Lieutenant 
Roxboron, who directly deals with the detective unit. I met with um, Kathy Lynn, who is very bright sergeant. Um, I approached her why she didn't review the detective when he simply took a false statement by my wife, ex-wife now, at the time wife, and woman space who tried to justify it. The simple fact what I did is I've been law-abiding citizen, 13-year resident of Eugene prior to that, Fresno, California. Perhaps my only connection to Africa is that my folks are Ethiopians. I am Ethiopian-American. I have to show this to the chief to let him know, my expired passport, my renewed passport. I am American, but as a result, even pretrial service office, when I was arrested and spent 31 days in jail, my bail was posted at $1.56 million, and I have to post a bail of $156,000 cash. 15% of that was straight out taken away from me by the court. So, is that justice? Absolutely not. Would I have been treated differently if I was white? Of, of course. My bail would not, I would not be in a flight risk. I would have been, bail, my bail would have been set based on the Constitution at $256,000. I would have been bailed at $25,000, rather $156,000. All in all, I'm simply asking you to review the six-month limitation policy imposed to Mr. Gissner's office, the auditor's office, so that he can review further and thank you. Irene Cardenas is next, followed by Garrett Dunleavy. My name is Irene Cardenas. I was at the mission. Now I've been camping in the forest. Um, people speak of the need for a wet bed shelter. Wet bed, is this the most consensus building term? Many people besides addicts benefit from a shelter that honors their personal lifestyle choices. Many people are quick to associate homelessness with mental health issues. Okay, so let's go there. Many unconventional personal styles are called mental disorders by psychiatrists who put themselves in charge of governing people's thoughts and feelings, but their government of our most personal lives is not a democracy. We have no vote in what they consider too unconventional. Which considerations of theirs can so disharmony and drive wedges in relationships when they are overreaching? If homeless shelters are referring homeless people to mental treatments, they should at least refer them to effective treatments. Year after year, medical research in medical journals has shown people labeled mentally disordered do not have perturbed neurotransmitter systems until they are medicated. The research shows medication generally makes mental problems and makes, makes them worse and chronic. This research is well documented in anatomy of an epidemic. At the 2008 APA convention, psychiatrists were told yet again they were giving people medication-induced diseases and the psychiatrists booed the presenter. They are not able to receive this information harmoniously and thus transmit it to patients harmoniously. And harmonious interactions enable harmonious minds. The world's most successful program for healing psychosis, which means psychological illness, addresses it as a problem involving relationships in the space between people. The person has a dilemma in her emotional life. The whole treatment team, family, and person together discuss and decide on the treatment so the person is not left out and isolated from the innermost decisions where they can decide how to treat her in ways to which she may not consent. Though they're acting friendly, it's actually isolating. Um, this open dialogue approach, here's a flyer. The documentary was shown at the library. There's a trailer on YouTube, Open Dialogue, has almost eliminated psychosis, which means psychological illness, where it's used in Finland. Also successful is brainwave balancing, which um, had a 100% success rate of healing methamphetamine addicts in um, Prescott, Arizona, after three months, and after nine months, it was still 83% success rate from brainstatetech.com. Thank you. Next is Garrett Dunleavy, followed by Dennis Gabrielson. 
First of all, Council, I want to say thank you for letting us have the time to come and speak with you. Uh, my name is Garrett Dunlavy. I'm a student at the University of Oregon, and I work with all of the major uh, sustainability groups on the campus um, and sort of speak as an ambassador for a lot of them. And this is... Hi, uh, Eugene City Council. My name is Nick Berardi, and I am the Education Coordinator at the UO Sustainability Center. And we're, we're here to uh, talk to you guys, sort of to, to share this uh, from the campus. The, uh, what we're going to, in the next two weeks, starting on the 16th and going through to the end of the week, we're going to be having Earth Week on campus. Initially, it started with Earth Day, and it, this year we're going to be expanding it so that it encompasses the full week. Um, we are here today to tell you about it and hopefully uh, get the involvement of those interested with the community at large. Uh, because we really would like to, you know, have you guys participate with, you know, those that, that really would like to share in this sort of experience. Uh, Nick is just going to talk briefly about what it is um, that we're going to be doing between Monday and Friday. So starting out on Monday, we, we have theme days, and Monday is going to be climate preservation, energy, and transportation. And we will be um, having different events, such as uh, we'll be showcasing in an amphitheater area a zip card, um, talking about uh, ride sharing, um, trying to reduce automobiles on the road, um, and also we will be doing uh, lecture panels, discussion panels at night, where students will be able to come and, and listen to a variety of professionals speak about um, different ideas. Um, so Tuesday will be uh, equity, justice, and health, where we want to talk about the collision of the environment and uh, social and public health issues. Um, on Wednesday, we'll move on to our built environment with buildings and working towards zero waste. And, um, and then Garrett will talk a little bit about his expertise on the business and policy day. So business and policy is going to be Thursday. And the undergraduate group that I founded, Net Impact, deals specifically in sustainable business and will be essentially running the uh, events for that day. And uh, within these events, we have Sylvia Hayes, uh, for those of you who don't know, who is the First Lady of Oregon, um, as well as James Curley, who is the CEO of Keen, uh, speaking earlier in the day, between 1 and 3. We can give you the details uh, later on. And um, then we're going to have other speakers like uh, author Kendra Pierre-Lewis later in the day, who will be talking about green consumerism. Uh, now these things are just sort of skimming over some of the major events, but uh, one of the things we wanted to get to you and possibly, uh, we've already spoken with Beth, um, we wanted to have um, an email or some sort of confirmation where we can you know, lay down a website or something that we can communicate with you guys about um, where we can uh, give you a document that will say have a comprehensive list of everything that will be happening during that week. So thank you guys very much. Thanks. Uh, Dennis Gabrielson is next. Followed by Carla Newbury. My name is Dennis Gabrielson. I live in the city of Cresswell. But I come to the city council meetings on a regular basis. And I come again to grade you, and I, I give the city council and the city manager a failing grade. Uh, over the last few months, you've spent about a million dollars for Occupy Eugene for uh, contract outing attorneys. We have city attorneys. Why couldn't they handle the caseload? That's just a question because I can't see paying $415,000 to attorneys when the settlement was 5550 bucks. Seems a little bit uh, bad. Uh, and the, for the Occupy people, you guys have the right to allow camping if they meet all of the requirements. First off, a permit. They didn't have a permit. A food license. They didn't have a food license. An OLC. They didn't have an OLC license. The bond. They didn't have the bond. Uh, so then the city's going into contract with one of its unions now, and I've heard some rumors about what's being, going to be asked of it. One of the rumors I heard was $100 uh, copay for the, uh, or not a copay, but out of pocket expense from your check. Now, over the last 31 years, the unions have gotten a percentage pay raise and the exempts have taken the same percentage raise. Now, over time, 
that stays the same percentage difference, but the money adds up, and it's a what was a $200 difference at the beginning is now a $540 difference. So if 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 you're going to do that for a a uh, pay raises, you should do it also for everything else, such as this health care. So $2,600 out of a, a general employee, you should be paying $21,125 a year in your health care. And similar for the other high-ranking ex exempts. The, we, I'm running out of time, so I, I just want to, I have a, a chart on here that shows you a, a graphic representation of the difference between and you'll notice this stays flatter than the exempt line. And I have a copy for each one of you. Thank you. Carla Newbury's next, followed by Kimberly Gladen. Good evening. I'm Carla Newbury, and I'm in George Brown's ward. Um, I recently finished serving on the task force. Um, it was a very interesting experience, and I appreciate the opportunity to do so. Um, I must say, with that many people, the process was frustrating and messy at times. However, everybody did their best, and I think we came up with a pretty good work product. I understand that on Wednesday you're going to start mm -hmm. considering it. And I don't know. I made the request, and it was agreed, and I made the request again of, of Chuck Crockett pardon me, Chuck Crockett, that he forward to you the specific committee reports. Because, of course, when everything was condensed down to the final report, a lot of the detail got lost. I think those are very important details. And what I would request of you is if those were not included in your packet, to please request that when that comes before you, because those individual committee reports give a lot of rationale behind the specific committee recommendations and a tremendous, tremendous amount of wealth of detail, very robust detail of some of the needs and some of the, the very, very workable solutions, many of which won't cost the city any money. Hopefully, the way we've recommended over, over time, this will be sustainable without costing the city a tremendous amount of money and hopefully eventually saving the city some money, especially around the laws and ordinances. It'll take a lot of work and attention up front. But, but I, I do urge you to look at that work in, in, in more detail if the only thing you get is the final report. Um, and, and I'd also like to remind you again that Although I understand the, um, the pressure that a lot of the social service agencies put on everyone in city government for, say, you know, people just need to get off the streets. They just need to go to the mission. They just need to get into shelter. Well, you know, at, at one count this year, I believe the homeless count of those people that they could find was over 2,000 people. My guess is that the actual count, I mean, I'm guesstimating, but I would imagine it's upward of 5,000. There's simply not the capacity. We just don't have that capacity to shelter everybody. So I would ask you to consider that in your report. Uh, one of the recommendations, of course, was um, around establishing a camp along, not along the lines of Occupy Eugene, that's been incorrectly reported, along the lines of Dignity Village in Portland. For me, that's one of the many recommendations that ha has worth. Personally, I would like to pitch for, for my favorite, which is the creation of a commission, which I think will do most for sustainability. Thank you. Thank you. Kimberly Gladen is next, followed by Mark Rust. Hi, I'm Kimberly Gladen. I live downtown, and I'm in Ward 1. Um, I'd like to talk tonight about benches. There's been a lot of bench controversy downtown, and a lot of claims that we need more benches. Well, we have a grand total of 37 benches just in the park blocks area alone, mostly unused. There are 21 benches in the east block, 
12 benches in the West Block, four benches at the Butterfly Lot, and over at the Wayne Morris Free Speech Center, there's over 200 plus feet of bench space unused. Most of the time, it's, nobody's over there. Even tonight when I walked by, there were only four benches out of 37 actually being used by people and nobody in the free speech plaza, which is a great place for people to congregate. Um, I hear a lot of talk that there's no place to congregate downtown. Well, what about the free speech plaza? Isn't that what that was created for so people could gather and talk? 200 plus feet of bench space, that's a lot of butts that can sit there. Plus, you got that big open area and it's unused. Seven days a week, practically, that is unused, completely unused. And so, but what I did notice was that there were a lot of people sitting on handicapped access ramps, which I don't get why that seems to be the great place to sit on a disabled access ramp. Um, I think what we need is not benches, but education as to where these benches are so that people know we have trees and benches and these beautiful places in our park in the center of our downtown. Plus, we have Skinner's Butte, a wonderful place that has places to seat up there. I've not counted how many benches up there, but there's quite a number of benches up there. There's also the Monroe Park very close by. There's the Washington Park also that has lots of benches, lots of places to congregate. So. We need to educate people as to the facilities we have downtown. And I find it's hard for me with our education system that students don't know these benches even exist. It's very sad. Another thing I want to mention, bike racks. I love them. I think the bike racks are great. I feel more bike racks, less cars, more bikes downtown. There's a lot of complaints about parking. I know a lot of merchants who would love to have more bike racks near their business for their customers. And I think you might want to take a poll of the downtown businesses and find out who wants more bike racks and give them to them. Because I like to see our downtown as part of a green, friendly experience. For me, the more people that give up their automobiles, the less money that goes to big oil and big business. And the better our planet's going to be, the greener our planet's going to be. So I would like to congratulate you on the bike racks. More of the same. As far as the benches go, we got plenty in the park. Let's educate people as to where they can go and gather and talk, because that's what the Free Speech Plaza is for. I hate to see it go to waste. Mark Rust is next, followed by Drix. Good evening, councilors, mayor. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Rust. I reside in um, Council Polling's district. And just before I start, I was sitting on a bench downtown uh, this morning. It was lovely out. So. I like those benches too, but I wanted to talk to you tonight about Envision Eugene. I'm unfortunately not going to be able to attend the upcoming hearing, so I wanted to share some thoughts tonight. I'm not going to have time to say everything I want to say. I did want to disclose too, for full disclosure, I am a land use planner uh, with Wayne County. I'm speaking on my own behalf tonight, nothing to do with what the county's position is. Um, I've been doing planning for, or related to planning for over 15 years, all in Oregon. I was involved with UGB expansion in Bend. I've lived most of my life in Eugene, though. I consider it home. Um, but so just a few comments. I think staff and the city manager has done an excellent job with a lot of complex information. But one of the things I'm concerned about is the employment land proposal out by Clear Lake Road. I think to use an Easter analogy, since yesterday was Easter, is putting all the eggs in one basket. I don't think it necessarily makes sense to put all the industrial employment land in one area. Um, there's, I have concerns about transportation infrastructure to serve all that land. Uh, when the decision was made to not move forward with the West Eugene Parkway, I think the door was closed on a lot of growth happening out west. Um, not to mention what the number I've heard is about a 65 to $70 million fix to Beltline needed to serve land out that direction as well. Also, in regard to the public need for school and park land, I think that there needs to be a bigger look at the need for the LCC campus and then the hundreds of acres of city-owned park land around that area for meeting the public need for Eugene for the next 20 plus years. I think the Envision Eugene project's gonna be one of the biggest things to impact our community for the, the next number of decades, so it's vital that we get it right. 
Um, also, the Willow Creek Basin area out by Gimple Hill and Bailey Hill proposed for residential expansion. I think putting roughly 500 new homes at the headwaters of uh, Willow Creek may not be the best idea either. If you look at that area, the Nature Conservancy's bought up hundreds of acres. The city owns a considerable amount of acres, all with the idea of preserving that drainage basin. And now to stick a bunch of homes at the very headwaters of that same basin, I'm not sure that's the best idea. Um, I would like to just say, uh, Councilor Clark made a comment at the March 14th city manager's presentation about looking at Goshen and I'll add the LCC basin. And it was told twice that um, by legal staff that it physically can't be added to the EGB. And once that was clarified that imagine the kind of cherry stem you'd have to do to do that. And I would just say maybe take a bigger look. I think um, it can be done without cherry. It's worthwhile. Thank you. Drix is next, followed by Robin Bloomgarden. Hi, Eugene. Um, thank you for thank you for a lot of things. I think I'll start with thank yous because usually I run over. Um, thank you for downtown. We've got those two pits filled up. That, that was a lot of doing. We don't have to worry about it anymore. Thank you for that one. And thank you for this forum. Um, tonight's really a diversified slice of Eugene, and I'm kind of proud of it. I got back from Portland today, and I'm just so glad we're not Portland. And I'm um, sure everyone else realizes as you're coming down I-5, you see our big, beautiful butte up there, and it welcomes you a good 30 miles away. So it's good to be here. Zoomed home. It gets light sooner or later, so I'm late, but it doesn't matter because here I am. Um, but change is something that happens if you plan it or not. Like, there's a lot of change. For example, I cut my beard off. Some of you noticed. Some people didn't notice. But that's change. It's a different me underneath it this time. So I'm, yeah, you laugh. But I'm getting adjusted to it. Um, just shows what change is all about. Nobody ever noticed I shaved off my eyebrows, too. Uh, <laughs> see, that change, and you hide some more inside of it. Um, why did I do that? Well, it's pretty inexpensive. It's kind of fun. It's a little edgy. It's just <laughs> all the things Eugene is. And, and um, <laughs> as I'm sitting here thinking about it, I realize I'm still trying to help us brand our city. What's unique about Eugene? I, I came up with a, coming up with a Eugene accent. Well, that's great, but I only had one word. You know, Eugene. If we said Eugene, that maybe people could identify us. But if we all started to shave our eyebrows, now that could be something. And if it didn't work out, they do grow back. So, oh well. Speaking of change, um, I live in a very changey neighborhood. I live in the West University Neighbors neighborhood, which is an awkward name, but it was coined by Charlotte Lemon, who lived in our neighborhood for 94 years. She. Uh, she was born and died in the same house for 94 years on, on 13th and Mill, just walking out of her front. I just can't imagine that for so long. But in the scope of naming neighborhoods, to name us a uh, Eugene, the West Eugene neighbors sounds friendly. But actually, we're not west of anybody except for the university. So we call ourselves the one, West University neighbors. Now that I've burned a minute casually, um, I'd like to give a suggestion. We learn things in our neighborhood, and we share them with all of you and people at home, other neighborhoods. Um, when our alleys were paved about three or four years ago, we did a lot of research and realized that we'd like to grab some time and pay it forward, share it forward. So we, uh, we put the dates in cement when we do them. And the city bought some cement molds that can put the dates in for $1,000. And they're all paid for, and they're sitting there. And um, it's kind of nice if you do things like that when you're constructing, because then people come down, and, and time moves on. And in our neighborhood, it stopped around the 30s. And now it's kind of picked up again in 2005. So it's just leaving our mark. All right, there's the yellow light. Time to go. Thank you very much. Thanks for missing me, too. Robin Bloomgarden is next, followed by David Piccioni. Hi, my name is Robin Bloomgarden, and I live in Andrea's district. Um, I want you and everyone on TV to imagine that an 8.0 earthquake has just destroyed 10,000 homes in Eugene. Over 20,000 people have suddenly been added to the homeless population here. The city council is called on to find solutions in a hurry. They cannot do anything about finding open land for temporary housing, which could be up to two or three years, because there are codes and zoning laws that take years to change. Sorry, but all of you are on your own. Good luck. Uh, well, we have a homeless crisis right now in Eugene. Homeless people are not wanted downtown. They're not wanted in the parks 
or anywhere in public. They're basically illegal. They want some place to be, some place to leave their stuff while they attend school or look for work or eat at the dining room. Simply finding some open land within the city and modifying some of the zoning and building codes quickly, many of the homeless would have a legal place to be now. They could get their lives together while becoming part of the wider community and then move on to be taxpaying citizens of the city. The city council could and should do this soon. Please note that no money is being asked for, only some land. Thank you. David Piccioni is next, and the last one is Art Bowman. He's a tall one, I think. Hi, my name is David Ivan Piccioni, and uh, what I want to talk to you guys about today, uh, councilors and mayor, is about the trees that are being cut down in Eugene, in Eugene, not outside of Eugene, in Eugene for reasons such as uh, uh, raised sidewalks or sewage systems that are interfered with. Uh, I, uh, I think this is a real big problem. I moved here from uh, New Jersey in 1990, and uh, I, one of the things that I really liked about this area was the trees. I had visited the Museums of Modern Art and the, Muse and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, and there was a lot of beauty there, but there was nothing that compares with the life, all kinds of plants, vegetations, uh, critters running around uh, in, in Eugene. So I think that uh, this is really the soul of the city and it needs to be protected. So uh, the solution that I propose is that if you have to cut something, uh, cut a tree for a reason that's unavoidable, such as a sewage system or a sidewalk that makes it impossible for people on wheelchair to go by. Uh, first, I, I think uh, this should be examined and seen if there's any alternatives like like uh, side, si being able to go on the side, uh, by the side. And, uh, but uh, even if this is done, uh, I think it's very important that the city has to take responsibility and replant the trees that they cut down. So it's not just a matter of cutting them down and forgetting about it. You have to replant them. And I haven't been seeing too much of that. So that's what I'm asking you to do. So thank you. Thank you. Last up is Art Bowman. Oh, well, and then I'm going to end the public forum and thank you. And um, just say thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you for your continued work, and we'll follow up on um, Wednesday with our discussion about uh, moving on the homeless issues, and we'll see where we go from there. Um, the, uh, thank you, Carol Burke Caldwell, for your continued work to, uh, to try to improve our system here. Um, well, can I, the sustainability, thank you for bringing that information. The best advice I can give you on that is if you go on the city website, you, there's a link to council and mayor, and you can just send information that way. Okay. And um, let's see. If uh, you have in, uh, questions you want asked, we have a public service uh, officer who can often answer questions for people, like some of the ones that you brought up. Um, and then uh, thank you for continued conversation about downtown and um, informative information for us to consider about Envision Eugene. And Drix, I don't know, eyebrows don't necessarily grow back the way they started before you uh, removed them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
I just wanted to say that we uh, we do have an urban forestry program, and even this past weekend on uh, Arbor Day, we had 100 people out planting trees. So trees really do matter a lot to us, and we have a pretty consistent policy of replacing trees. So, and and in fact, in our packets every week, if a tree is being taken down, our the urban forester has to <coughs> let us know it's, it's happening and why it's happening, so we can see that um, information. So I wanted you to know that. Yep. Okay, with that, <coughs> Councilor Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. I was going to share that uh, comment about the urban uh, forest. Um, I've had a couple trees die in my front yard, and they came and take the trees out, and then they replanted them. And Drix, I just want to say that um, some of us, you know, do things with our face, but then hair shows up in other places on our face. <laughs> and so, you know, we have to be really careful about the distribution of hair because it, it gets um, a little unruly when you get to be our age. I also want to thank everybody for coming out. It's always um, good to hear from the, the varied people of our um, community. And the, for the gentleman with the police auditor, you know, we set that protocol up. So, if, so I will be glad to talk to you afterwards because the, the uh, thing is we have a lot of rules already in place with the auditor and it's not just um, because we say so kind of thing to change it. A lot of it's an ordinance and so we have to really follow the rules. And I'm looking forward to the email from the um, <coughs> Sustainability Commission at the U of O. Thanks. Councilor Taylor. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, about, I want to speak about benches and trees. Um, I do think, I <coughs> thought for a long time we need a stronger tree ordinance. The trees, if the sidewalk has to go around the trees, then it should go around. I like the way they do it in Carmel, California, where the trees have numbers and the houses don't. But that's, that's, how, that's how important the trees are there. But you cannot replant a tree. Trees take a long time to grow, so it doesn't take the place of a, if you cut down a big tree, planting a little stick doesn't, does not take its place. So there should be a really urgent reason to destroy a tree. Um, about benches, I, it, benches aren't like restrooms. If you have restrooms here and there, you can go find them. But, but places to sit, if you meet some people, when I think about a friendly downtown, I think there should be chairs around so that if you meet some people and you start talking and then it, and you want to sit for a while, you can pull over a chair. And there should be some stationary tables and some chairs that people can move to make their own little groups instead of saying, we're talking, oh, we better walk three blocks away and where they have benches. It isn't, it's, uh, you, you need places where you can decide to sit down. And uh, I remember once being downtown after a play, <clears throat> walking out with people who had their cars in different directions and, and we stood on the street corner for a while and then we realized that's when the mall was still there. We realized we were breaking the law if we were sit, standing there talking after a certain time at night. But you should be able to stand around, you should be able to pull up a chair and ask other people, why don't you come sit with us and we'll, and you should be able to bring your lunch downtown and, and find a place to sit and, and carry drinks around and things of that sort. So that's the kind of thing I think that makes a friendly downtown a place where you want to be. And the trees protect our life and our air, our air, the life-giving air and water. That's all. Thank you. All right. I think that concludes uh, our pub the public forum. No other... Okay, so next is the consent calendar, and I'm going to pull item C. I've already had a request from Councilor Zelenka to pull item, and C, item C, so I'm going to pull item C. Um, we'll see. Uh, and Councilor <coughs> Poling? I was going to request item C be pulled also. Okay. So that's pulled, and so you want to put the motion on the table, Council President? Oh. Yes. I move to approve the items on the consent calendar. Second. Moved and seconded. So, uh, we can please vote. So, seven in favor, none in opposition. It passes. And we'll go to item C, and we'll first go to Councilor Zelenka, and then we'll go to Councilor Poling. Councilor Zelenka. Cindy, if you could just uh, briefly describe the, uh, the grants that we're awarding. That's all. Sure. We had six <clears throat> projects that were recommended for funding. Um, the Churchill Area Neighbors Walkability Project is a collaborative that involves the Bailey Hill Safety um, Committee. Uh, it's building a, um, a pedestrian refuge in an area where children gather uh, right by um, its Acorn Park. 
Uh, it's, it's a really great project. It involves the entire neighborhood, the local neighborhood, the neighborhood group, the Bailey Hill Sustainability or Safety Committee. You remember them from the, um, probably from one of their prior funded projects. Um, <coughs> We also have a tree inventory and assessment. That's Jefferson Westside Neighbors. They're working with the Tree Foundation, uh, and they're going out and mapping and marking all the trees in the neighborhood. And that's um, some of it will be done electronically so that the city can use that information when they go out and do their tree assessments. Um, the Map Your Neighborhood Map Your Neighborhood Project uh, Action Plan Eugene and Helios. It involves three neighborhoods that got together, and they're doing some um, outreach. And it's sort of a train the trainer for. Um, community emergency response training in their neighborhoods. Um, the South University Traffic Sign Enhancement Project, that's a, um, that's a great project. Um, they're all great projects. Um, but that involves some decorative signs. There's, that neighborhood has a lot of problems with vandalism and signs that get removed, stop signs, street signs that get removed. And it costs the city a lot of money to go out there and replace those signs. So they worked with our traffic operations and traffic maintenance um, to come up with a plan and a design to have some decorative posts installed that will have the they have additional safety features where it makes it harder for them to remove, for vandals to remove the stop signs and the street signs. Uh, and then uh, we have the Will Willamette Natural Area Gateway. It's nearby nature. They're um, the hosts at Alton Baker Park. And this project involves um, a pretty extensive restoration, invasive species removal, and um, litter abatement along with training. It's, they're involving two of the um, charter high schools in the, in the program. And then the last project was the Willa Kinsey Grange site improvements. That's um, a great collaborative with Metro Housing and the Willa Kinsey Grange and the Harlow Neighbors. They've identified the uh, Willa Kinsey Grange as a showpiece for their neighborhood, and it's in need of some repairs. So this is a site um, improvements, um, the building improvements, painting the building, uh, maintaining the historical value and um, uh, integrity of the building and it involves a huge celebration with Metro Housing where they will do historical tours and site tours and really uh, reintroduce this uh, showpiece to the neighborhood. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Colling? I didn't know Councilor Zelenka was done. Thank you. I don't know if he's done or not. Are you done? <laughs> um, in reference to the Willkenzie Grange site improvement, I had a request several months ago made uh, by uh, one of the people working on that project if I would write a letter of support. I've never been asked to do that for a, um, uh, for one of these uh, matching, neighborhood matching grants. Uh, I didn't write the letter because I knew at some point, and, and in consulting with, with uh, some of the other people, I knew that at some point if this would come before the council and I'd be able to, to uh, voice my support. But I think this is a great project, considering that the Willikensee Crossing is, is just about completed with their construction. And they're, I believe phase one is full, and they're starting to fill up phase two with residents. Um, it's it's a quite, a, quite a project that's been going on. And, and actually, this has been a, a discussion since the very start, as far as working with the Grange and with the uh, Willikensee uh, um, crossing and metro housing to do upgrades in that whole in, entire area. And I think that this will really add to that part of, of the, uh, the neighborhood. And I'm very supportive of approving this, especially this matching grant. Any comments? All right. Would you please vote? Do have it in favor and none in opposition? Okay. Matching grants. Good. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. So the next item up is a special one. It's adoption of a resolution initiating celebrations acknowledging the 150th anniversary of the incorporation of Eugene. And I brought this book that I frequently use about the story of Eugene by Loy W. Rowling. And it says on page 66 in this book, um, incorporation first talked about in 1862 stirred much argument. Eugene had not grown up enough to take on the dignity of civic honors, some said, and besides incorporation would mean taxes. The state republic held this point of view. Some of our citizens are striving to have Eugene City incorporated. The reason for their move is that they wish to banish the common nuisances, hogs and grog shops. The author further states, in spite of these sentiments, the town did make itself an incorporated city on October 17, 1862. 
In no time at all, she decided she wished to change her name to the city of Eugene, and on October the 22nd, 1864, she voted to adopt a new name, and in November, a new charter making new boundaries. But there was such small interest shown on the matter that there were only 27 votes for it and one against it. <laughs> so that's the, uh, the story. So we have a, the, I'm going to tell you what the resolution says, and then we'll put the motion on the table. And this is, uh, that's what we look at. Um, a resolution initiating cel celebrations acknowledging the 150th anniversary of the incorporation of Eugene. The City Council of the City of Eugene, Eugene finds A. Eugene is a special and unique place. The area and community have been home to thousands of people since 1862 and before. B. Eugene's founders first took action to form a city in the year 1862, filing papers for incorporation of Eugene. The year 1862 has traditionally been given as the date of Eugene's first incorporation. C. A well-used historic resource Walling's illustrated history of Lane County, Oregon, 1884 states, quote, the town of Eugene City was duly incorporated by an act of the legislator, legislature approved October 17, 1862. D, this is a significant milestone that the city of Eugene wishes to acknowledge and celebrate. This anniversary provides an opportunity to learn more about our history, culture, and people. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the city council of the city of Eugene, a municipal corporation of the state of Oregon, as follows. Section 1, based on the above findings, the city council initiates a period of celebration entitled Eugene at 150 to continue throughout the remainder of 2012 to honor our community's history, celebrate the present, and create a legacy of pride that builds excitement for Eugene's future. Help create and inspire multiple ways to celebrate this important milestone. Include the experiences and legacies of diverse community members, past, present, and future. Encourage collaboration, partnerships, and community participation. Exercise responsible stewardship of resources. That means don't spend a lot of money doing all this, right? That's <laughs> and leverage community assets. This, this resolution shall become effective immediately upon its adoption. So. I move, I move to adopt resolution 50. Oh. I move to adopt resolution 5056, initiating celebrations, acknowledging the 150th anniversary of the incorporation of Eugene. Second. Moved and seconded. <coughs> Councilor Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I don't know if this is the appropriate time or not, but when we first were approached with this subject that we were going to be doing this, I had hoped that we would, um, I requested that we would make sure that all of Eugene's history is being told, the glorious and the not so glorious decisions that were made by this community. And I just want to make sure that that, um, for the record, is there. And I will support the motion. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Even just to say Go ahead, say it, Mike. Well, I think Alan's all over that. Okay. <laughs> That's what's good. All right. Ready to vote? Please vote. Seven in favor and none in opposition. We have resolution. All right. Thank you all very much for this evening. It's complete. Oops.